okay? All of these volumes are very precariously perched back here, so I'm hoping none of them fall down. Barry, that'll be your job. You have become one with the stone, Barry. Make sure none of these volumes fall down at any point during this video. Well, anyway, hey everyone, how you doing? Teching here, uh, and we're going to be talking about, yes, the final chapter of Dr. Stone, chapter 232, and the finale of the entire series. It's over! Before we get into that, though, I just wanted to bring up one thing on this uh, video being on the vlog channel, right? We're on Teching 1001 instead of the main channel. I just want to try something new out uh, to see if this works or not. Um, for the main channel, I'm going to keep it with, like, One Piece content, Bleach content, uh, probably the My Hero Academia content. But for a lot of the other series that I don't talk about as regularly, so like Dr. Stone, Black Clover, Mashal, if I ever do another Mashal video, which I really do want to do because uh, I've been rereading the series, Undead Unluck, those kind of uh, those kind of series, I I'm probably going to try to put them on the vlog channel from now on. Um, if it doesn't work out, then I'll just go back to the way it used to be. But I just want to try this out for a little while. So thank you for indulging me on that. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah. So last chapter of Dr. Stone. Uh, how'd you guys feel about it? Well, we'll get into that. But first, let me just say that this story, Dr. Stone, for the last five years now, has been one of my favorite manga of all time. I love the art style. Boichi does a great job there. Oh, by the way, before I forget, in the next issue of the One Piece magazine, because everything comes back to One Piece, in the next issue of the One Piece magazine, there's going to be another Boichi-drawn One Piece chapter, and it's going to be the battle between Khalifa and Nami from Eni's Lobby. So that's going to be sexy as hell. So just wait for that, I guess. It's going to be epic and sexy. All right, but anyway, Dr. Stone, Boichi, amazing artist, Inagaki, great writer. And I, this is... This is one of the few manga that I've actually been following since it began its run in Shonen Jump. Do you know how rare that is? Like, Undead Unluck, for example, um, I uh, had to binge like 80 chapters to get caught up because I wasn't reading it from the beginning. Same thing with Mashal, I had to read like 30 or 40 to get caught up to Mashal. But Dr. Stone, pretty much from day one, I was there. And that's just so much more of like an emotional experience when you start the series and then all the way to the end. And I remember it was um, because of Weekly Manga Recap, it was because of Rollo T and Wilder. Why Roller of Time, Nick, whatever. I'll put their links and stuff below in the description. Go check out the uh, Weekly Manga Recap podcast. And way back in 2017, they asked me to come on, and they were like, hey, yeah, we're going to talk about all these series, and Dr. Stone was only at, like, Chapter 3 at that point. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, I can get caught up on this really quick then so I can talk about it on their podcast. So I read Chapter 1, 2, and 3 of Dr. Stone. It was, like, right when Sukasa Awoke was the chapter we were discussing. And I'm just like... I love this concept. I love this idea, like the world getting turned into stone, and then there's like a whole focus on science and, you know, building up from the stone world. I mean, I love that concept. And so because of that, every time I've been on Weekly Manga Recap since over the years, um, it, we get to Dr. Stone, and I'm like, ooh, ooh, can I talk about this Dr. Stone chapter? Like, I don't care about One Piece. You know, Nick, you could talk about One Piece, whatever. I want to talk about Dr. Stone, <laughs> you know? So I love the series, and I've been with it since the very beginning, so I wanted to thank them for that, uh, Rollo T and uh, Why Rule of Time, because they're basically the ones that got me into it. Um, but uh, it's over now, and it actually ended two weeks ago. I was actually on vacation in Okimo in Vermont uh, when it ended, and I read the last chapter up there, so I didn't really have a chance to talk about it. Uh, but just this past weekend, it was very somber for me because I sit down to go read, you know, the new releases of Shonen Jump. So, like, One Piece, My Hero, Black Clover, Mashal, Undead Unluck, which, by the way, yeah, Undead Unluck is getting very, very solid, very good, so go read Undead Unluck. But I'm reading them, and at the very end, it just, it just felt like, part of it was missing. It felt like I was missing a piece of the puzzle because I always read Dr. Stone and there is no Dr. Stone and there's not going to be another Dr. Stone. Although I have heard, and I don't quote me on this, but I have heard a rumor that there's going to be an OVA, not an OVA, but a one shot. Um, I don't know if that's actually happening or when it's going to happen, but I read like an article somewhere that said like there is going to be a one shot of Dr. Stone. So I guess there is going to be a little bit more to the story, but like the main story is in fact over. So um, how did you feel about the final chapter? How'd you feel about the ending? Uh, let's just go through it, I guess. Let's just go through the final chapter really quick, and then we can talk about, like, you know, the series in general and, um, what I loved about it and how the ending was handled and stuff like that. Okay, so, um, after Senku goes to the moon and talks to the Y-Man or Petrification Devices or Medusas or whatever you want to call these things, he tells them, you know, his plan that he's got, and they're like, yeah, there's no way that'll ever happen. The odds of that working are, like, next to zero, so we're just gonna leave. So they just leave. After waiting 3,000 years or whatever, they just leave, and it's just like, oh, 
okay, bye. And then one of them stays behind with Senku. And I have this little puzzle here that I spray painted green, which I don't think is the official color of the uh, petrification devices because we had a color spread last chapter and I think they're blue. So I always assumed they were green because of the green petrification wave. But no, I guess they're blue, which whatever. I want to get a little case for this and then draw a smiley face on it like they do in the series. It's a cute little thing that Senku has now. But anyway, um... So, after they left, they basically go back to Earth, and the uh, beginning of this chapter, the final chapter, 232, is just everybody arriving back on the planet. There's no big deal on, like, re-entry or anything. They just kind of gloss over it. Uh, we have an award ceremony where Senku, Stan, Lee, Ryu, Sui, and Kohaku receive medals. Kohaku's asleep on the stage, which that fits her character perfectly. They get these really cool E equals MC squared medals. It's like, that's awesome! And then... Senku just goes around high-fiving everybody, like Tsukasa, Taiju, Yuzuriha, Kaseki, Kohaku, Luna, um, you know, Kirasame is there, like, everybody's there, he's like, Ruri, everybody, and he's like, yeah, we, we did it, everybody, science triumphs, yeah, all right, and then we just cut to several years later. We don't know how many years go by, uh, but we have planes now that are up and running. We have paved roads, automobiles, like modern technology is slowly appearing again. I'm imagining it's maybe like four or five years because the characters aren't aging that much. Um, so yeah, maybe like four or five years at most. Uh, Gen is working as like a diplomat between uh, Japan and the United States. So that works for him. Uh, Taiju and Yuzuriha got married, which that's always been like a side thing. Like at the very beginning of the story. Honestly, at the very beginning, I thought, like, Taiju was gonna be the main character of Dr. Stone, because for that first arc, it's kind of like Taiju's perspective, and then it becomes like, no, Senku is the main character now, and it's like, okay, and then um, Taiju and Yuzuriha talked about how they like each other, and it's just like, oh, we should get married, and it's like, well, let's wait until after everything's over, and it's like, well, everything's over, so they got married, and I'm happy for them, you know, that was something that finally got resolved. Um, one of the things, though, with Dr. Stone, though, is is just because of the large cast, and I think Inagaki did this for a reason at the beginning, it's like, okay, you know, in order to build the world back up from a stone world to a modern society, you're going to need a lot of people to help you out with that. There is no way Senku could do that by himself, regardless of how intelligent he was, right? You need to have a lot of people, so therefore you have to have a large cast, and Dr. Stone does have a very large cast. However, because of that, certain parts of the story, you have to take part of that cast and like, okay, you're going to stay in the U.S., or you're going to stay in South America, or you're going to stay in uh, Japan, or whatever, in order to help build up the world. And because of that you don't really get to see a lot of them for the later parts of the story. Like, for example, I was just thinking about this the other day. If you were a really big fan of Ginro and Kinro, pretty much after Treasure Island, they don't do much of anything. They're not even really in the story much after that. Like, Ginro's big moment was at Treasure Island, and then Kinro helps, you know, fight against, you know, the uh, the kingdom there, and then that's that's pretty much it. So you don't really get to see them much else in the story. And it's like, yeah, they characters might pop in every now and then, like Taiju, Yuzuriha, they might pop in every once in a while, but, like, even Tsukasa, their, their stories are kind of, like, done. You know, like, after the events of Treasure Island, or really after the events of the Stone War, after Tsukasa was defeated, and then he died, and then he got put in the cold sleep, and after he woke back up again after the end of Treasure Island, Tsukasa's story is essentially over. There feels like there could be more with it, but it's like we don't have time to focus on it, so we just kind of move forward. So, whatever. Uh, we actually have a scene with Tsukasa in this chapter, and he mentions that, like, okay, me and Hyoga and Zeno, we all bloodied our hands to make sure the world would not turn out the way it did before, and we're gonna have to pay for that. So, Tsukasa says, like, at this point, the idea of such a grim future is a distant memory. And I'm kinda like, I'm kinda scratching my head at that a little bit, because the whole point of Tsukasa's character was like, you know, I don't want the world to get back up to the way it was, because all it is is gonna be, like, the adults basically taking it over. Um, it, it's gonna be all about power and money and who rules the world, and everybody else in the world, like, are gonna be, are gonna suffer because of that. Like, the regular people are gonna suffer because of that. And it's like, that was Tsukasa's whole point of the Stone Wars, and, like, choosing who to revive, and, like, smashing the statues. Like, he didn't want the world to turn out like, well, honestly, like it is right right now you know exactly he didn't want that he wanted something else and here he is basically like well the idea of that happening is is just a distant memory now and i'm sitting there reading that and i'm just like how do you know that sukasa see that's the thing it's like it's such a 
such a syrupy, sweet kind of ending of the story where everything's just happy and everyone's coming together and singing Kumbaya that it's, like, a little bit unbelievable. It's like the ending of, like, a children's storybook. Like, everybody lived happily ever after. And I understand, as a mangaka, why you would want to end your story with a and everybody lived happily ever after. So it's a positive note. It's like looking to the future. But I'm like looking at this and I'm like, Sukasa seems to think that like, yep, all those things that made the old world horrible, corruption and everything, that'll never happen in this world. We're all good. That's a distant memory. Now that Senku's in charge and we have science, like there'll never be another world war. There'll never uh, be a cruel despot or dictator. Um, even though Zeno himself has come out and said, like, yeah, I want to be a dictator, like, even though that's the case, don't have to worry about that, that'll never happen, all of the people of the world are gonna come together and work together in unison, it's a whole new world with a brand new, brand new attitude, um, and, and Senku's gonna make sure everything's okay, and Tsukasa sort of has this really, to me, it just seems like naive optimism, but, like, okay. Hyoga even brings up, he's like, well... You know, once law and order has been officially reestablished, uh, we're going to have to pay for our crimes, you know, because we killed people and shit. And uh, we're going to be judged and condemned. And Ukiyo was there, and Ukiyo was kind of just like, well, that all depends on what Senku's new invention is, if he can succeed or not. So I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that's going to be. So then we have probably the sing. Oh, wait, no. There's one more scene with uh, Chrome and Rui that I have to bring up, because this is great. So... At Taiju and Yuzuriha's wedding, Chrome and Ruri are sitting together at the same table, and they're kind of talking. And uh, Chrome just kind of turns to Ruri, and in the most, like, you couldn't get more less romantic. He's just like, hey, Ruri, after the science team finishes up their new invention, let's get married. And Ruri is just like, well, okay, obviously, yeah, but <laughs> it wasn't very romantic. And so we see Kohaku and Luna like crying like, yep, that's a scientist for you. Just like Senku. Very blunt, blunt all the way. But I guess that implies that Chrome and Ruri, that that was the closest Chrome got to like confessing his love to Ruri. And I assume they are going to like, like Ruri did agree. She's like, okay, sure. But it's like, that was really funny. And that's, that's like perfect end to Chrome's character. I find that very hilarious. But then we have the scene where they go into the lab and they see a character that looks a lot like Senku from the back. Like their hair is like Senku's hair and everything. Hey, Senku! And so Taiju walks up and it's a, it's a woman that just happens to look a lot like Senku. And uh, she's got her lab coat, which is like barely buttoned. She's wearing a lab coat. She has, she has huge boobs. And her lab coat is like three sizes too small. So like it's barely like buttoned. You know, I, I think Boichi just really wanted to draw rule 63 Senku. <laughs> At some point in this story, it's like, I really just want to draw rule 63 sexy big busted Senku. But... I just never had an opportunity, so screw it. We're just putting it in the last chapter. And there's, like, no explanation. Like, they walk up and, like, hey, Senku, what? And then, you know, she's there. And we never find out her name even. We never find out what her name is. She just says, like, oh, every nation has sent a, uh, a different scientist here to work on this project. So... I guess she's just another scientist from some other part of the world that we never learn about, never find out her name. She happens to look completely identical to Senku, um, to the point where you could say this was Senku's sister, and I would buy that. Um, and there's just no further explanation of that. So it's like, yeah, Boichi just wanted to draw Rule 63 Senku. So whatever. I I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that, like... It kind of came out of nowhere, and there's very little explanation. So, um, they are, uh, they, they took one of the old uh, Medusas, one of the ones they found in South America, and they were, like, broken it open, and they begin to experiment on it with, like, the modern technology they've, they've gotten back to. And so they're looking at that, and they say, oh, well, Senku is in the, uh, the inner chamber, okay, working on his big project. So Taiju and Yuzuriha and everybody are like, all right, let's walk in. Like, Chrome's there, everybody's there. He's like, let's walk in and say hi. So they walk into the inner chamber, and we see Senku there in a mirror of the uh, the way he appeared in the first chapter when Taiju opened up the door to the school. And he's just like, you know, Senku, I'm going to tell you Zuriya how I feel. And Senku was working on this random, like, device. He was, like, shoving these vials of liquid into this device. And we never learned what it was. 
And the implication was, this is insane, we find out at the, here at the end of the chapter, Senku is working on a damn time machine. He's just like, I'm gonna build a damn time machine! Science! <laughs> and it's like, the implication is, wait, was Senku working on a time machine in the first chapter of Dr. Stone? <laughs> Which... Once again, I'm not weirded out by that. A lot of people seem to be, like, put off by the concept of a time machine. Like, a time machine? Really? And it's like... Uh, hold on, we'll get to that. I'm not, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. Because this is something Senku would do. And we're gonna explain that in a second. But anyway. So, um... It's mentioned by the petrification device they have in the capsule, like, you know, oh, the uh, the goal of returning to the past to make sure that, um, you, you know, the, the members of my race, the other members of the Medusa don't die and the members of your race don't die. That would be very beneficial because the whole thing with the Medusas is their concept of life and death is just very, it's just very like, like death can never happen. Death is the most terrifying thing ever in existence. It needs to be completely just removed from like removed from life. If that makes sense, removed from existence. So they're like, Oh, we're going to go back in time and save everybody. And Gen is like, wait a second, go back in time. What do you mean? And then we see a giant version of the Medusa, like the Medusa, like blown up to like, you know, 1000th scale or whatever. And it's this huge uh, machine. And Senku's just there like, yeah, we're making a time machine now. And it's like Gen and Ukyo and everybody's reaction is just like, what? And then we see a shot with Senku reminiscing. Uh, we see him as a child. We see Byakuya there and Lillian and all the astronauts there kind of like, you know, like, yes, Senku, you can do it. If anybody can do it, you can do it. And Senku's there just looking very kind of serious. And um, this is something very awesome, by the way, that, that, um, that Inagaki included. We have a scene with Zeno there. And he's just talking about, like, you know, the concept of not even time travel, but the concept of sending information into the past so that, like, an AI savior could, like, help humanity. That has been something that has been discussed for a while now. And as he's saying that, an image of Ray from Byakuya Reboot appears behind him. So this was mentioned uh, to be, like, a side story or a Gaiden that doesn't take place in the real Dr. Stone manga, like in the story. But what I think that Inagaki did here was he incorporated this, uh, this manga, this Gaiden, as another timeline. Because let me explain something here. When I think a lot of people saw Time Machine, they instantly might have been thinking of some, like, Back to the Future shit. I even saw a lot of people that were like, wait a second, if Senku creates a Time Machine, he would go back in time, make sure the petrification never happens, so that means Kohaku and everybody just wouldn't exist. That's a horrible ending. He's basically all of his friends that he's made, Chrome and Kohaku and everybody and Kaseki, they would never exist. And it's like, no, 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 no. That is not the idea I think Inagaki is going down here, all right? Because if you guys if, if um, you've paid attention to any sort of like time travel fiction, time travel sci-fi or whatever in recent years, um, it has evolved quite a bit since like the 80s with like Back to the Future. And a perfect example of that is Avengers Endgame. Um, I'll, I'll, spoilers for Endgame if you haven't seen it. It's been like three years now. Oh my god, has it been three years since Endgame? Oh my god, it has been. Oh my god, wow. Anyway, yeah. But even in Endgame, it was mentioned by, like, uh, Ant-Man, Scott. He was kind of like, as long as we, you know, uh, obey the rules of time travel, we don't be, we'll be okay. We don't talk to our past selves and everything. And Tony uh, is just like, is that how you think time travel works? And it was, it was explained in the movie that, like, when you go back in time, you're not creating other... Like, you are creating other timelines, but you're not messing with this timeline. Think of it like in Dragon Ball. That's the perfect way to really think about it. Toriyama was really ahead of the game with that. When you go back in time, you're not messing with your timeline. You're creating a new timeline, okay? And there was somebody, even in the comments of the Viz chapter release, that really did a great way to explain it. Um... And there's been some look into this. I mean, yeah, the idea of time travel is, like, fantasy, but it's not something that's so much of a fantasy that it hasn't been looked into, like the concept of maybe how this could work. And uh, here's the comment right here by uh, Habaliane. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name there. I should mention a lot of talk on time travel is really misinformed. The current thinking of theoretical physics is that causality doesn't really matter as much as humans think it should. If you go back in time and shoot your grandfather, you don't die. You just come from a timeline where you 
you didn't do that. So, for example, Senku could go back in time and do whatever he wants. He could destroy the world if he wanted. The events of Dr. Stone, like the canon of the story, of this story of Dr. Stone, that would stay the same. Nothing would change. You know, the petrification would still happen. It was just, It would just be like he created another timeline. So... I think that's the goal of Senku, to make a time machine, to go back in time, to make sure the petrification never happens, or maybe they can communicate with the uh, the, the Medusas a little bit better or whatever to make sure it doesn't happen, and uh, maybe even save humanity. So there's like two different timelines. Maybe they can hop back and forth between them. Uh, we see the roadmap to the time machine, and the major thing here is the light speed cyclotron motor. And the reason they get to light speed and the reason why Senku was so excited was because the Medusas are defying gravity. And it's even like explained a little bit here of how it works. Um, you know, a type of pool called a Higgs field gives mass to fundamental matter particles. The petrification devices are capable of altering the water pressure in said pool, reducing its mass or weight to zero, allowing it to fly. Now... I'm not a scientist here, but that's like, that's impossible, right? To reduce something's mass and weight to zero, I think that's impossible, and that's the point. Like, it's a piece of technology that can do something humans were never able to do. So, because zero mass and zero weight exist now, you can now create light speed. So basically, rather than the time machine, I think a bigger focus should have been, because the, the light speed thing is just in the corner. I think that's the main thing Inagaki should have mentioned. Like, humanity now has access to fucking light speed. Like, that would be, in, that would be huge. Like, that would be a revolutionary piece of technology that, sure, it might lead to something like a time machine, but the main thing is, like, we have light speed now! Like, that's that's the big thing, I, I guess, to take away from it. We have a, a means to achieve light speed. Okay. So that's the big finale. So anyway, yeah, that's the goal. They're going to create a time machine, go back, and if it, even if it takes decades or centuries to really get this right... Uh, because they have the petrification device, uh, they can make that happen now, and they can continue with humanity as long as they can keep using this one in the vacuum. Just keep this in the vacuum. Keep making the new batteries. They can make the new diamond batteries to put in. They could probably use this thing indefinitely. I mean, not indefinitely as in forever, forever, but as long as for several centuries, if they keep it in a vacuum, they can keep using this. So disease has pretty much essentially been wiped out, I guess. Maybe that's what Sukasa was talking about, like because of Dr. Stone and because... Um, um, uh, there's no more disease and stuff like that. Maybe that's why he was so optimistic. But no, to me, that would just mean that there's somebody out there on the planet that wants to steal this. It's like, oh, you mean to tell me there's only one device in the world that can achieve light speed and this device can also cure any illness? Hmm, I'm going to steal it and then I'll make my own empire and then if anybody wants to listen to me, they have to, you know, want, wants to be healed, they have to come and use this and I have it. You know there'd be some cruel bastard out there in the world that would attempt to do such a thing. So that's what I mean. Like, that's kind of a really syrupy sweet kind of ending but anyway anyway that's the end that's the end it's like to discover and unearth the new rules about our universe uh that's the goal so i say get excited so soruze korewa and then we just see a shot of senku at the end looking epic the end that's the series and um like i said like i said i, I had some criticisms with the final chapter but it's, I can't not get excited over the concept of Senku achieving light speed travel and making and using that. Like when he was on the moon, he realized, holy shit, you guys can float around like you're defying the laws of physics. That means we can have light speed, theoretically. And if we have light speed, I might be, I might be able to make a damn time machine. So he goes over to the, to the Medusas and he's like, hey guys... Crazy idea, but I can make a time machine to go back in time to make sure none of you died. He's like, that is the stupidest idea ever. We're leaving. And then they left. And then it's just like, one left. Okay. Um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring this up here because it's something that I've been a little bit um, curious about. I, I don't want to call it a plot hole necessarily until I get like you guys to weigh in on this because it is something that I'm wondering so when we find out about what the petrification devices were all about, their whole thing was they travel to a planet to parasitize and they're just like, okay, we're going to take over the planet and we're going to petrify everybody and then they're going to break out and then they're going to realize how valuable this is and then they're going to, you know, manufacture new Medusas, new batteries for the Medusas 
and um, that's going to be their ultimate goal, like a parasite kind of, rela like a symbiotic relationship, right? That was their whole point. And the way they went about this was sending a scout party to petrify the swallows, and then sending the main force to petrify the entire planet, and then Senku was like, why did you do that? That really set back everything. Like, it, sh it shot your own plan in the foot, pretty much. And the petrification device is like, well, we assumed humans were more intelligent. We didn't think it would take you 3,000 damn years to break out of your stone. It's like, okay. Um. Why couldn't the petrification devices just talk to humanity? And tell them what they wanted? Like, I don't want to call that a plot hole, because I might be not looking at it from a certain perspective, but, like, these things are capable of thought. They're sentient. They're autonomous. They're aware of their own existence. They're capable of, of thought. And even, like, when Senku went to the moon, they were perfectly willing to talk to them and explain to them, like, this is the reason why you've been petrified. This is the reason why we did this. So they were perfectly happy with explaining the whole situation you know, to Senku with words or radio waves, because that's how they communicate through the radio signals, right? So they were perfectly okay with that. Why didn't they do that 3,000 years ago? <laughs> like, that's my question. Why didn't they just try to communicate with humanity back then, back when we were at our current level of technology, and just be like, humanity, we are whatever their name is. We are the petrification devices. We will work with you. We want you to create more of us so that we will continue our own existence because death is scary. And so why didn't they just like travel down to Earth and like give themselves over to the scientists of the Earth and be like, okay, this is how you activate us. This is how we work. And it's like, okay. And then scientists could mess with them and they'd be like, okay now. So we want you to make new versions of us and keep us healthy with our batteries and stuff, and um, then we'll be okay. Now, the idea why they stayed on the moon is because the atmosphere is poisonous. It's, it's, it's deadly to them. So fine, but they can communicate through radio waves. So just don't go into the atmosphere. Just communicate with radio waves to the Earth and just be like, this is what we want you to do. Because the only way they had to do this was like, yeah, we're just going to like throw a bunch of us at the planet, petrify the whole damn thing, and just hope that you understand what our goal is? Like, if you're capable of communicating through radio waves, why don't you just do that? And um, if anybody has a good explanation for that, let me know. Because <laughs> I've been kind of, like, scratching my head of, like, why they would not at least attempt to do that even when they were going on the story of it, like, with the Treasure Islanders. Like, it's like, oh, the they, they detected the Treasure Islanders because they were uh, polishing ore that was giving off radio waves. And they're like, oh, those must be some survivors. Okay, let's just, th let's just throw the petrification device at them so they can figure out what to do. It's just like, the only way, it's, 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 it's acting like the only way that these things can convey their plan is by petrifying people. But we've shown that isn't the only way they can convey their plan. They can communicate. So, I don't know. Let me know about that. Because that, that, that's bugging the crap out of me right now. I guess. Why they didn't even attempt to do that. Um, they didn't even try. You know? It's just like, just like we're just going to petrify Earth and they'll, they'll figure it out. And they waited on the moon for 3,000 years. But then when they realized that, like, oh, I guess you don't have enough technology to make more of us. Okay, bye. Whatever, off to another distant star. All right, whatever. Anyway, um, that's Dr. Stone. Um, the ending, like I said, was okay. Um, it was a mixed bag for me, definitely. I don't hate it. I didn't love it. But the bulk of this story was so good that the ending being kind of eh is fine with me. Like, I'm okay with that 100%. And I will be looking forward to rereading this series. This is definitely going to be one of those series every couple of years I'm going to reread again and again and again and again. Like, I just know that right out of the offset. So, um, there might be a one-shot coming out that might explain some more stuff. So, I guess we'll wait to that to see what happens there. Um, I hope the one-shot takes place a lot further into the future. I, ho I hope the one-shot takes place when Senku's like 50 or something, and we can really see how much, you know, he's developed over the decades. Because I'm imagining working on a freaking time machine that's going to take, like, Senku, I think, even mentioned in this chapter, like, this, like, the giant machine that he was building, that's not really, um, 
you know, that's not really the time machine. That's like just a model of it or something. Um, you know, I think he says something like that. Yeah, right here. Looks pretty slick, huh? That's Kaseki saying that. We started off with just the structure. So it's kind of like just a prototype of a prototype, but like they'll get there eventually. Um, but yeah, the idea of time travel, like different parallel timelines and stuff, like you go back and make a new timeline, like in Dragon Ball, I think that's what they're handling here. And that would be pretty cool. But um, yeah, that's that's my thoughts on it. Thanks for watching the video, everybody. Um, yeah, this will be Techie 101 and Barry signing out. Later, everybody.